Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Robert Haas. I work at Enterprise DB, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about the challenges of uh, concurrent DDL. And so that means that this is a very hacker-oriented talk. Uh, I am expecting that everyone in this room will produce patches at the end of the session. So uh, if that's not you, you might be in the wrong talk, but you're very welcome to stay. And uh, maybe I'll even say something comprehensible, but uh, this is a little bit on the more technical end of the talks that I tend to give. So uh, if I lose you, I apologize for that in advance. Um, I'm going to start with a quick problem statement and a couple of acceptance criteria, and then basically the rest of the talk is going to be going through some of the things that I've seen come up repeatedly when people try to write patches to allow DDL and Postgres to be more concurrent. And I realized as I was working on this talk that there was absolutely no way that this list was going to be exhaustive. Uh, in the time that we have. So these are some of the things that I've seen uh, come up repeatedly, but you may have your own list of problems if you review these kinds of patches or have thought about these problems. Um, and certainly any particular patch that you try to write or that someone tries to write may have additional problems which are completely outside the scope of anything that I'm going to be talking about today. So this is a, a set of themes rather than an exhaustive list. So what do we mean by concurrent DDL? Uh, I think we mean that we want to allow users to change the definition of an object, that's the DDL part, while at the same time the object is being used. That's the concurrent part. Um, in theory, this could be any kind of object that is created using some kind of create statement. Uh, so it could be a table, which is probably the most normal case, or a materialized view or something like that, but it might also be a schema or a function or a text search dictionary or any other kind of object that you can create in PostgreSQL. Um, and I said, well, the object is being used. So I'm not really talking about trying to change the definition of the object while somebody else is also trying to change the definition of the object. That seems really hard and probably not that important because nobody's really upset about the fact that you can't run an alter table and at the same time run another alter table that's changing something else. I mean, maybe somebody's upset about that, but I haven't met that person yet, to my knowledge. Uh, and that would be super difficult to implement. It would have every problem that I'm talking about in this talk and many, many more, and I just don't think it would be a very good place to invest effort. But what people are upset about and probably the reason why many of you are here is because you don't like the fact that there's some alter command you can, you don't like the fact that there's some alter command that you need to run on a table and while that command is running you can't select from the table or you can't update or delete or insert on the table. That's what's bothering you. So we're talking about changing the definition of the object while the object is being used, not while the definition is being changed in some other way. So what does success look like? I think this is really a two-pronged thing. And I think that sometimes when people are designing patches in this area, they don't remember that there are these two parts of it. And uh, sometimes people think very hard about one of these problems and they kind of know that there might be some issues for the other one, but they don't really know what they are. They haven't thought about them carefully. And so then you end up with a patch that's maybe very good in one sense, but maybe not up to the mark in the other sense. So the first thing is that the behavior has to be in some way comprehensible. It, you have to be able to explain to the user, if these two things happen at the same time, what is the behavior going to look like from a user point of view? The user has to have some chance of being able to predict what the outcome is going to be when things happen at the same time that would normally happen consecutively. And I'll give a few examples of this in just a minute. And then, of course, the other part of this is that it has to be reliable. You can't make the system crash or hang or spit out scary internal error messages or corrupt data or anything like that as a result of the fact that somebody did concurrent DDL. And as you'll see, in a lot of cases, the problem is not that my session gets messed up when we do concurrent DDL. A lot of the problems are that your session gets messed up when we do a concurrent DDL. I execute the DDL command in my session, and someone else's session then crashes or returns a wrong answer 
or does something like that. That's where a lot of the problems tend to creep up when one is putting together a patch of this sort, at, at least in my experience. So let's talk a little bit more about what it means for the behavior to be comprehensible. And this is a case that we actually discussed recently on hackers. And it is kind of thorny, but also kind of interesting. Uh, we do not currently allow these two commands that are listed uh, at near the top of the slide to be executing at the same time, but we'd really like to allow that. We'd like to be able to detach a partition while at the same time work is continuing to happen on the table. So I have the example of copy here. So imagine that you're copying rows into a table, uh, a partition table, and there's a stream of rows that are coming into the table. And while that's happening, somebody detaches one of the table partitions. Well, the thing we have to think about is, what happens if we now encounter a row after that detach has happened that ought to go into the partition that was just detached? We have to make a conscious decision about what behavior we think is appropriate in that case. And I think there's more than one defensible choice. You could argue that we ought to just continue to store the rows into the detached partition, even though it's not a partition anymore. It's just another table. Or we could maybe uh, just throw the rows away. They just disappear. Or maybe we should throw an error. But this, they all seem a little problematic. Like throwing an error seems pretty natural. That's usually what we do in Postgres when we don't know what to do. We don't usually just soldier on somehow. But now how concurrent is your DDL, really? Right? We could store them into Foo1 anyway, but what if Foo1 has subsequently been dropped? I mean, once it's detached, you could do anything to it. You could drop it. Maybe you could uh, you know, change the column definitions so that it has different columns. Now inserting that tuple into that table is going to be really hard, right? This behavior of throwing the rows away has a certain appealing simplicity, and it might even do what the user wants, but that kind of doesn't feel right either, right? So in order to make this happen, the first thing that we're going to need to do is make sure we know, if these two things happen at the same time, what is going to occur? We may or may not need to explicitly write that down in the documentation, but we at least have to be convinced in our own heart that we have a behavior here which is going to be not too surprising. Here's a second example. Suppose we want to allow these two things to happen at the same time. Same copy command, but now, uh, instead of detaching a partition, we're adding a constraint. So what happens if, after we've added the constraint, the copy command reaches a row that would violate that new constraint? Well, you know, before we said insert the row anyway as one of the options, but in this case, that would mean that the constraint ends up violated. So that seems like uh, probably a non-starter, right? Because if you add a constraint and the constraint isn't even valid the moment you added it, you kind of, in a certain sense, have not really added a constraint, right? Uh, so we could discard the rows uh, as before. We could error out, but then how concurrent is your DDL? Maybe there's some other option. But it's the same kind of problem. Here's an example of a case that I don't think has this sort of issue really to worry about. Uh, here we've got the same copy command, but now the thing we want to do is change the fill factor assigned to the table. I, I think it's pretty clear what should happen here. The new old fill factor may continue to be in effect for some processes for some nebulous period of time that has to do with things that I'll talk about later in the talk, but eventually everybody's going to be using the new fill factor. And I think we can safely say that if we alter that fill factor and some amount of time that's not too ridiculous passes before other people notice that change and start using it, nothing really bad is going to happen. You might have some pages that are not filled quite as full as you thought they were going to be or they're less filled, but that's sort of okay. So this kind of thing, to me, doesn't really have any big semantic issue associated with it. We know what the behavior is. We're setting the value going forward. Existing stuff can just keep running, and there's really no definitional issue there. That's what I have to say about well-defined semantics. There may be more than one defensible behavior choice, and it isn't my purpose here to say which behavior you should pick, just that if you're going to try to write a patch to do something like this, you have to pick something. <laughs> uh, and it has to be something you can explain to somebody. 
at least another hacker. One of the biggest problems that we get into as soon as we start trying to write patches that actually do this kind of stuff has to do with the relation cache, which we affectionately call the rel cache, or that thing that I don't understand but always messes up my patches and then Tom Lane complains at me because somehow things aren't right. That's the other name for the rel cache. Uh, what the rel cache basically does is it stores metadata about each table that has been accessed in a particular session. That session reads data from the system catalogs and it does a bunch of computations and it puts together a cache entry that represents the state of that relation. But it is a cache, which means that as, as soon as somebody changes something, our cache is out of date. And then we might have a problem because if we have an out of date notion of whether it's a log table or an unlog table or how many columns there are or the types of those columns or anything like that, then disaster is going to ensue because we're going to do the wrong thing. So we have to have some way of making sure that that cache gets invalidated. And the way we do that is that when a backend performs DDL on an object, it sends invalidation messages into a, a shared queue. And we sometimes refer to this as synval, synval messages, the synval queue, or the shared invalidation queue, something like this. But of course, it's not enough to send invalidation messages into a queue. Somebody has to read them. Otherwise, they don't do anything. So other backends have to read those messages and invalidate their local caches. And I think you can see that there's some sort of timing problem here, right? Because those, the other backends cannot possibly be guaranteed to read all of those messages the very instant we send them because they might be doing something else. They might be running some other piece of code. And they can't just magically jump into the code that reads invalidation messages just because we'd like them to do that. They're going to have to reach a point in the code where they actually perform that action of reading from the invalidation queue. So it's not going to happen instantly, but it also can't be pushed off forever into the future because then we might as well not have bothered to insert the invalidation messages in the first place. There has to be some kind of interlock here. People have to invalidate their stale data soon enough that they don't rely on that stale data for anything critical. So we need some sort of interlock, some sort of lock. Yeah, we need a lock, right? Uh, this is the way that this is designed in PostgreSQL. When a transaction commits, it puts any invalidation messages that it has produced into the shared queue before it releases its locks. And on the other hand, when some other transaction acquires a lock on a relation, it checks for new invalidation messages after it acquires the locks. So everything is sequenced. The invalidation message is inserted first, then we release the lock, that then allows the other process to acquire the lock, after which it reads the invalidation messages. So there's a, a hard ordering there that makes sure that the invalidation messages get read uh, sufficiently early in the process. As soon as we get the relation lock, we are going to process those invalidation messages. Um, and this works provided that those two locks conflict. You only need to have an access share lock, which is the weakest kind of lock, on a relation in order to build a rel cache entry. Therefore, you must, with various exceptions that we've grown over the years, hold an access exclusive lock when you're changing anything, because that's what makes this system work. The access exclusive lock is the thing that makes the access share lock wait long enough to process the invalidation messages so that it is guaranteed to see them and it's guaranteed to know that its data is out of date and it's guaranteed to rebuild uh, its local cache with the correct data um, and, uh, and then everything is good. And of course there's another related problem here too, which is that if you use access exclusive lock for everything, then the data that we're using to build the cache entry can't change while we're in the process of building the cache entry, right? Wh which is a real problem as soon as you start doing concurrent DDL. So 
so the point of this slide is to emphasize how critically dependent we are on these access exclusive clocks. They're, they're not just there to make you hurt. Many, many of them are there because of this exact problem, that the rel cache entry can be built with only access share lock. And to make sure that doesn't happen either while we're changing things or when we're or before we finished changing things, right? Or, you know, it, it makes sure that the rebuild happens at the right point in time when nothing's changing and when we're going to see all of the latest information uh, based on the changes that our sessions have made. So, I'm going to talk in a minute about what the consequences are uh, when we lower that lock level, but first I'm going to talk you tell you about a few general gotchas of the invalidation system. So the first problem is, or the first thing I want to mention is that uh, typically, I should have the word typically uh, in there somewhere. Oh, the slide is a little messed up. So typically, invalidation messages are processed at the beginning of each statement, and whenever we need to take, uh, whenever we take a new heavyweight lock, and at a few other times. And so what normally happens is that at the beginning of the statement, we process invalidation messages, and then we don't process inv invalidation messages after that until the statement finishes, which sounds like great behavior, right? It's really simple. The current values stay there for the duration of the statement, and then we'll process invalidations, and things might change. But unfortunately, there are numerous exceptions to these general rules, which are one of the things that makes writing reliable code in this area very, very painful. We might not actually process invalidations in certain cases at the beginning of a statement. We might not do it until the beginning of the next transaction. So if you have a open transaction which runs for a long time, and for example, only runs prepared queries that it has already run before, it won't acquire any new locks, none of the accept invalidation messages calls in the C code will be reached. And that process will not process invalidation messages until the end of the transaction. So conceivably, the old state could, the old state of the catalogs could still be out there in somebody's cache for hours. On the other hand, we sometimes do process invalidation messages in the middle of running the current statement. And a typical way that this happens is we have a cat cache miss. In addition to the rel cache, which is what I'm mostly talking about in this section of the talk, we have another cache called the cat cache or the sys cache, which caches individual tuples. And if somebody does a lookup using the sys cache and they're looking for the tuple with relation OID 43,296, and we don't have that tuple in our cache, we've got to go read it from the catalog. In order to read it from the catalog, We've got to open that catalog. When we open that catalog, we acquire a lock on that catalog. Then we process invalidation messages. So right there, boom, in the middle of what looks like C code that does nothing interesting, there is a very, very small, but non-zero probability that we will suddenly accept invalidation messages and things that you might have expected would stay the same. Suddenly those data structures have changed right under you. And this is a fruitful source of bugs, because as any of you who are programmers know, stuff that can happen, but happens very, very, very infrequently, is really hard to test, and is, it is a common cause of bugs. The other thing about this that is worth noting is that whenever we process invalidations, we process all the pending invalidation messages, not just those pertaining to the relation we're opening. So because we open PG class or some other system table, we're not just at that point processing the pending invalidations for the table we opened, we're processing pending invalidations for everything. So all kinds of cache entries, any user table we have open is suddenly now subject to having an invalidation happen at that point. Except it almost never will. But if you compile with clobber cache always, then it always will. And the system will be incredibly slow, but you will find a lot of these sorts of bugs that way. So, Reducing lock levels really breaks everything here, and we end up tiptoeing around in lots of complicated ways to try to unbreak it. 
So there's at least four different things that can happen as soon as you lower the lock level for a particular piece of DDL. Um, the first one is that other backends might now be doing stuff based on stale rel cache contents. So whatever is different between the rel cache entry they have and the latest state of the table had better not be anything very critical because it has to be okay for them to be using the old data. There's no way to prevent that once you lower the lock level because the rebuild can now happen you know, too, too early before the data is fully visible. Another thing that can happen is that the rel cache contents can change between one access to the rel cache and the next access to the same rel cache. It is now possible in a world of concurrent DDL that we hold a lock on the relation and we've got a rel cache entry for that relation and then somebody commits some concurrent DDL. And so now the next time we go back and look at that rel cache entry, it's different because it's been rebuilt. And we might have processed invalidations in the middle somehow. In fact, the data could even change while we're in the process of rebuilding the rel cache entry. And sometimes people say to me, no, 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 Robert, that's why you did all that work uh, some years ago, five years ago, to replace snapshot now with MVCC snapshots. But those people are wrong. That's not what that work does. Because that work guarantees that any particular tuple is read from the catalog using some MVC snapshot instead of this funky snapshot now thing that we used to have. But it does not guarantee that all of the catalog tuples that we read in the course of building the rail cache entry are read using the same MVC snapshot. They can all be different. So we can end up with a rel cache entry that is sort of a mix of old content and new content. And if you're expecting the data to be self-consistent, that can obviously pose some pretty severe challenges. And another consequence of this is that a, a, a rel cache data structure to which we hold a pointer might get freed at a surprising time. We not, might not be pointing to the top level rel cache entry, we might be pointing to some other subordinate data structure to which that top level rel cache entry is pointing. And now some concurrent DDL comes along, changes something, we build, rebuild the rel cache entry, we notice this piece of data over here has changed, so of course what do we do? Well we free that data structure and we create a new one, or actually we create the new one first and then we free the old one. But now you've got a pointer to memory that's been freed, so something bad will happen to you after that. Here is a concrete example of this kind of hazard. If you look at this code and you immediately shiver, then you're well on your way to understanding why this is such a hard problem. So the first line of code here, the first two lines of code here, uh, the first line pulls, a, 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 you know, initializes TG, the second line initializes toop, and then we, uh, we have a loop and we loop over uh, all of the triggers whose information is stored inside the trigger desk to which TG points. Uh, and then at the end we have some cleanup. We have to release the syscash tuple that we got. Who sees why this is terrible? I bet you do. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The trigger descriptor pointer could be changing. And it, it, it's the search syscache here that's the risk. Because normally this search syscache you know, we're probably somewhere down deep in the code. Most likely that tuple is already in the cache. So probably this code will work fine when you test it because the tuple will be in the cache. And so we won't process invalidation messages at that point. And so the, po the, the pointer rel trig desk will stay the same and the code will work great. And you'll say, I'm such a smart guy. My patch, patch is finished. But if you convince someone to check in your patch, or if you check it in yourself, then all of the clobber cache always build farm members will immediately turn red. Because on those machines, that always provokes an invalidation. And that pointer changes. And now your cache pointer is invalid when you get down to here, and really bad things happen. A and I think this sort of underscores the general difficulty of taking a large amount of code. I mean, we've got code that looks vaguely like this all over the system. 
And the only way to find out uh, which places break when you start allowing concurrent DDL is to go and audit every piece of code that has anything to do with what you're changing. Or like just test it a lot and see what crashes. Those are hard things to do. The code was written with the assumption, there's lots of code that was written like this with the assumption, this is fine because the rel cache entry is not going to change under me because there is no concurrent DDL. Oh, well, now there is concurrent DDL. Something that looks pretty innocuous actually becomes deeply unsafe. This is another example from some recent work that I was doing. This is a greatly simplified code snippet. And this is code that actually runs while the relation cache is being rebuilt, uh, in particular to rebuild some partitioning information. So what we do first is we call this function find inheritance children, and it returns a list of OIDs of child tables. And then we loop over that, and for each one we do a syscache lookup to get the PG class row for that tuple, and we do some stuff with it. Uh, there's a really bad synchronization problem here if you've got concurrent DDL going on. Because find inheritance children is using direct access to the catalogs. It is not going through a cache. It directly does an index scan on the catalog and it finds all of the rows that we care about. But this search this cache thing is running after that and it's going through a caching layer. So that means that the data retrieved by search syscache can come from a time period that is either before or after the time period at, at which the index scan run. If we've got old cache data floating around, this search syscache call might retrieve the old version of some data rather than the current version of some data. But on the other hand, if we don't have any cache entries yet, we might go do a new catalog scan in order to find that row. And something could have committed in the meantime, right? After find inheritance children has run, some concurrent transaction might commit a concurrent DDL change. And now, you know, this got the old information and this has the very newest information. And depending on what you're doing, that may or may not be a problem. But in this particular piece of code, it definitely was a problem because find inheritance children was getting the list of partitions, and the reason for this search syscache one lookup was to get the partition bounds. And you are obviously going to have loads of problems if those two things are inconsistent with each other, because if you see an old version of the tuple and a partition has been concurrently attached, then you're going to say there are no partition bounds, even though this thing is a partition. If you were concurrently detaching, then you would have the opposite problem. Actually, you can have both problems in both situations. It's a real mess. And it's hard to actually just change this because my first thought when I ran across this problem was, well, this isn't so bad. I'll just change this to use a direct catalog scan as well. And I was like, no, 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 I can't do that. That's going to be really slow compared to what we've got today because this cache is here for a reason. It makes it fast. So I eventually figured out something that I think works but I'm hoping to pique your curiosity so you all go look at that code and read the long comment and see if it looks horribly broken. Okay, so can anyone see why this code broke when I was wor working on concurrently attaching partitions? This is a severely simplified version of the code but basically what it's doing is we figure out how many partitions the current relation has and we allocate an array of that size and then we go fill in each element of that array. And the way we find the information about the individual partitions to fill in the individual array elements is by going through this append rel list thing which contains, it actually contains every parent-child pair of relations that's involved in the query in any way. So we skip the entries that don't pertain to the relation we care about. So this code is executing for each child of the relation. So we figure out how many children we've got, and then for each children, we fill in 
at entry in the array, then this assertion fails. What happens? I added a partition, and why, 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 what's wrong with that? You know, it's kind of hard, right? Like, you, you see that that fails, and you know it's somehow related, but it's not really obvious. Like, you could spend a lot of time staring at this code saying, does this code have a concurrent DDL hazard? And I don't know that you would come to the conclusion that it does. And the reason is because there's huge action at a distance going on. Rel n parts is not being initialized in this function. It's being initialized in some completely other part of the code. Different function, I think different file, some totally separate place. And append rel list is also not being initialized in this function. That's also built being in some other place. And it turns out that the places where those initializations are happening are two different places in the code. So rel n parts is ultimately coming from the rel cache. And the data in append rel list is also ultimately coming from the rel cache. But they're coming from two different rel cache accesses in two different parts of the code at two different times. Therefore, if there's concurrent DDL going on, stuff might break. That's all I have to say about the rel cache. If you'd all like to give a collective sigh of relief, I think that would be entirely warranted. <sighs> but unfortunately, we're not done. Um, shared invalidation messages not only invalidate rel cache entries, but they also invalidate all kinds of other things, including cache plans. So as soon as you reduce the lock level bef below access exclusive lock, you create a risk that an old plan based on the old table definition, will be executed. And sometimes that's OK. For example, if you've made some change to whether newly inserted values can be toast compressed, the plan doesn't depend on that. You would get the same plan with that change or without that change. It doesn't really matter. The plan is going to be the same plan. Um, and even if it weren't, users probably aren't going to get very upset about this being done slightly differently in a concurrency scenario. So it's probably fine. Um, but if you've got something like column types, it's really unacceptable because you ha your plan has to be based on the correct set of column types. Like you can't be like, oh, this plan was constructed for integers and now we have text, but I'll just use the same plan anyway. Well, no. Like the, everything the query does is based on what type of data it's working with and you're just going to completely blow up. Here's a few examples of this. Um, what happens if we just ignore the fact that some changes occurred? By the way, for the people taking photos, I will be putting these slides uh, on the internet, Google Robert Haas presentations. I, I think they're actually already up there. Um, but if they're not, they will be just after this presentation. So th this will be available if you want to look at it later. So what happens if we run an old plan just after some hypothetical concurrent DDL operation. So in the case of a current attached partition, the result is we're just going to ignore the old partitions. The planner didn't know about them at the time when the plan was created, so we're just going to act as if they don't exist. That's probably OK. Doesn't sound too scary. We have a short window of time, hopefully short, during which we might run a plan that doesn't know about a partition that was just concurrently added. OK, not terrible, I think. Um, Departi detached partition is a lot scarier, right? What if we run a plan that is based on there being 10 partitions and now there are only nine partitions? What if one of those things that used to be a partition has now been dropped or further altered or anything? Well, now we've probably got some, some problems, right? The drop case in particular is really bad because when we go try to scan the drop table, we're going to try to read data that doesn't exist anymore, and we're going to get some kind of scary internal error message, and the user's going to call support and say, my database is corrupted, and it's going to ruin somebody's entire day. Um, add column. This is another case. This is a case, a, hypo a hypothetical feature to allow a concurrent add column would have lots of problems. But it wouldn't really have this problem, because as in the attached partition case, the query plan would just not know that the new column existed yet, and it would run uh, exactly as if uh, that column hadn't yet been added, and that'd probably be fine. Th there are a bunch of other reasons why this really does not work, but this is okay. 
and concurrent drop index is another really bad case, right? What if the plan is using the index that got dropped? That's obviously not going to work. Now, someone in this room, or maybe like 20 of you, are thinking, but wait, don't we have a concurrent drop index command already? And the answer is we do. Um, and we've actually got a number of these commands which use a strategy that I'm calling multi-step changes, which is actually a really powerful strategy that's really useful for solving a lot of these problems. Uh, we use it for create index concurrently and re-index index concurrently and drop index concurrently. And there's more things we'd like to use it for, like enabling checksums uh, on a running cluster or maybe even a table rewriting operation like cluster. Uh, and basically what we do when we use this kind of multi-step strategy is we first make some kind of a state change to let everyone know what we're about to do. And then we wait until we're sure that everyone has gotten the memo. And then we perform the next step of the process. So for example, for drop index concurrently, it works approximately like this. We tell everyone, please do not read from this index. We wait until we're sure that everyone has seen that message. At that point, we know there are no remaining plans that are going to scan that index. So then we can move on to step two which is, say, please don't insert into this index either. We had to continue inserting into the index in step one because people might still be using it and they'll get the wrong answer if the index isn't being kept up to date. But now that we know that nobody's reading from the index anymore, we can also stop maintaining the index. So now we tell everybody, please don't insert into index, in this index either, and we wait again until we're sure everyone has gotten that message. Now we know that there are no reads happening for the index we know that there are no writes happening to the index, and we can remove the index. So that sounds pretty great. There are a few disadvantages. Um, one of them is that right now, the way we do that waiting is really inefficient. When we send out shared invalidation messages, we really do not know whether or not those messages have been received by other backends. And as we talked about earlier in the context of the rel cache stuff, it may be that those messages are not received for hours because somebody's got a long running query or a long running transaction open and they're not paying attention to them. So we can't get them to read our messages quickly and we don't know whether they did. So we have to fall back on something that's fairly pessimistic, which is we collect a list of transactions that have that index locked and then we wait until the end of all those transactions. Since we know that invalidation messages will always be processed at the beginning of the next transaction, that's sufficient. Um, Andres Freund has a patch for global barriers. I haven't really looked at that in too much detail, but I'm hoping that might give us a better way of waiting, or maybe we need some bigger redesign. But I think we need some general purpose system somewhere in Postgres where you can push out a message and everybody is supposed to read that message within a few seconds and they tell you when they do. So that instead of having to wait maybe for an hour, until all the current transactions have ended, you can just wait a second or 10 seconds or a minute or something like that, and everybody will get your message, and you can then move on to the next step of the process. Um, there are some problems with that, but uh, I, think, I think we need to somehow come up with a system for waiting that is uh, less painful than what we've got right now and doesn't make the command wait as long before proceeding to the next step. Another problem is that these kinds of processes create garbage. You can crash while you're in the middle of the multi-step sequence. So for example, say you tell everybody, stop using this index, and you wait, and then someone removes the power. Well, when you come back up, everyone knows, everyone has definitely now got the message because they're all restarting from scratch. So now every process in the system knows that it should not read that index. It also knows that it should continue writing to that index because that's the state that you left everything in. So now you have forever an index that is in this intermediate state where it's not doing anybody any good, but you're still spending all of the effort to maintain the index. Now, if the DBA knows that this is a thing that could happen and watches out for it, you can certainly repeat the command and again try to drop the index concurrently, and that will work just fine. 
but the DBA doesn't necessarily even know that this kind of threat exists. And even if they do, they may not notice it. And then you're just wasting a lot of effort for, for nothing. This could potentially be fixed, maybe some kind of background process that runs around and looks for indexes that are stupid and gets rid of them periodically, something. And this, you know, this problem of garbage or this problem of being sort of stuck in an in-between state is very general. Any of these processes that involve a multi-step sequence of changes, you have some version of this problem which is going to happen. All right, last slide, uh, except for the one that says thanks. Um, any DDL statement has to acquire the strongest lock that it will ever need at the very beginning of the operation. And if it doesn't, and it later tries to get a stronger lock, a deadlock may happen. And this is really sad, because a lot of people have come up with ideas, or at least some people have come up with ideas, where they said, we don't really need a strong lock for this entire operation. For most of the operation, a weaker lock would be fine, but then at the end, we need to do something that is going to require the stronger lock. So their goal, which is a laudable goal, is to minimize the period of time for which the strong lock is held. But unfortunately, this can really backfire if you do it, because you can get deadlocks. Say you have a DDL operation that acquires share update exclusive lock, and then later it upgrades to access exclusive lock. Most of the time, that's going to work fine. But suppose in some other session, somebody acquires access share lock, for example, by selecting from the table, and then later they try to acquire access exclusive lock by saying lock table block. Well, now you're one, either, that op, either that transaction or the DDL operation is going to roll back. And in many cases, we're talking about an extremely expensive DDL operation, which might have run for like hours or days. So having it roll back uh, because of some stupid thing that a user did is pretty unfortunate. There is, as I said at the beginning, a lot more that could be said of this topic, but I'm just about at time. I think we have about two minutes for questions. So would anyone like to ask a question? Noah. Uh huh. And I wonder about something you said in the past about that if you try to run a DDL transaction and it doesn't go through first, how do you get rid of it? I, I feel like, given the limitations of the architecture that we have, it's hard to do better in a lot of these cases. And we frequently have to make a choice which one we hate more. Do we hate creating non transactional things more? or do we hate not having the concurrency more? And I think that's a hard decision because I think we know from users that they hate both of those things. And so it's sort of a judgment call, in, in my opinion, which one is worse. I think one of the things that we should try to do is come up with better framework that maybe would somehow allow us to not have to make that trade-off, but I don't know exactly what that would look like. Yeah. Yes, Grant has a real locking deficiency. And when you use a function as a possible quasi DDL, uh -huh. it has the possibility of just being less than a function of R in the case of DDL. So I'm wondering if the function that you create that isn't a function of the custom DDL, if you have to act with a packet sharing function. Yeah, so uh, it's a really good question. Uh, and I think that there are definitely areas of the system where the locking has not been thought through as carefully as it probably should have been. I think it would be great if you shared your experience with this on the mailing list, because obviously any answer that I give you to the question of should we do X in this forum means nothing. Uh, OK, yeah. But, but in general, what I can say about that problem is for tables, for alter table type commands and for things like creating indexes and index operations, the locking has been 
thought through much more carefully than it has for a lot of other things. So things, not only things like grant, but also almost any operation that you do on something that's not like a table, like a function or a schema or whatever, the locking has not been thought through as well. So there may be both cases where the locking is overly stringent and some lesser lock level would be appropriate, and also cases where we're nearly not really locking where we should be. So yes, that is a, that is a problem. I agree. Yeah. I do not know off the top of my head why there is some restriction on the types of indexes that drop index concurrently can handle. Right. So the question is about a generalized cleanup system, and uh, we kind of have to stop here. But just to answer that briefly, um, I, Alvaro tried to do something a little bit like this with auto vacuum work items. And a lot of other people have tried to create systems of one kind or another that basically they all work the same. They want one centralized background worker that goes across the entire cluster, and then they launch per database workers, and then those per database workers do something. And multiple people have written code for this. Uh, and I think it would be a good idea to have some kind of better framework for doing that sort of thing. There are a lot of important design constraints on that because, for example, if you just have one set of background workers that do all of the tasks that people throw into it, then you may have issues of prioritization and whether the most important things are getting done first. So I think it would be a, a nice idea to have some kind of better system there. Uh, Figuring out what that should look like will take a lot more discussion. That's all the time we have. You have about a little over 10 minutes to get to your next session. I'm very happy to hang around a uh, afterwards and take individual questions, but that's it.